Well, good morning, everybody. This is one of those days when we were kids. We'd beg the teacher to hold class outside. But I don't think we're equipped to do that. But we're beginning this morning uh, what I hope will be a series on the Gospel of Luke. So please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. I said, I hope it'll be a series. I'll be okay if the Lord takes me, but uh, it promises, though, to be a somewhat long series because the gospel itself is a comparatively long book of the New Testament, actually even longer than it appears if you take into account the fact that Luke wrote a sequel to it, which we know as the book of, of Acts. Uh, but the gospel begins with an elegant introduction, which I would like for us to read here at the start, along with the author's beginning statement in uh, Acts. So let's read four verses. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us, by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. And then, uh, let's look, if you thumb over to Acts, you don't have to, you know it anyway, but this is how the book of Acts uh, begins. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. And that was the signal that Luke was embarking on what we might uh, wittily call the rest of the story of how the risen Christ did not cease his saving work, but continued it through the services of the various apostles and other servants of the Lord and in the power of his Holy Spirit. You know that because you've read the book of Acts, you've even studied the book of Acts. If you have an outline, you can see that I want to begin our study by thinking for a moment about the place of the Gospel of Luke in relation to the other uh, Gospels. I'm not trying to be pedantic or scholastic here, but it is very interesting. Uh, why are there four Gospels instead of only one? Uh, that's a question worthy of more time than we're able to give it. But the easy answer is because there were four Gospels written that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, uh, the four Gospels that were written came forth from authors who had their own purposes in mind, uh, their own individual experiences to draw on, and who had their own personalities and styles. They were probably not from the beginning actually called Gospels, though Mark does, Mark does begin his with his intent in writing. Uh, the first verse reads, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But he was using the term more in its uh, vernacular, the common vernacular, vernacular, which we all know is literally the good news, the, the good message, euangelion. It's what we get our word, words evangel, uh, evangelism, evangelical from. In other words, uh, all of these connect in some way to the very good message of salvation in Jesus Christ. So these four books of the Bible eventually became the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, the first three Gospels are known as the Synoptic Gospels, described that way because they're more similar in content, order, and seeming intent than John's Gospel, which stands apart in many ways. 
Tradition holds that the Gospel of Luke was indeed written by the man Luke, uh, though nowhere is this explicitly uh, stated. Most of the good commentaries on the Gospel outline the history of the various prominent early church figures who cite Luke as its author, making it clear, if not with ironclad evidence, that the man whom Paul referred to in Colossians chapter 4 verse 14, as the beloved physician, and who himself traveled uh, with the apostle on a good portion of his missionary journeys, evidenced, as you know, by the we passages uh, in several chapters of Acts, was with little doubt the faithful friend of him and the servant of the Lord. Uh, it was Luke who wrote the gospel. Luke's gospel is the longest of the four, and since he is the only one who wrote a sequel to his gospel, uh, he ended up writing more of our New Testament than any other author. I don't know if you knew that or not. He's a noticeably educated man. That's apparent from the language he uses and the rhetoric he employs. This opening prologue, which we have just read, is written in classic Greek style, varying little from the type of opening statement one would find in other classic uh, Greek literature. Uh, but then the birth narratives, which we love so much out of the Gospel of Luke, uh, and, the, and in the remainder of chapters 1 and 2, have a, a very strong Hebraic flavor. Uh, as if he based it on an independent source, perhaps even translating it directly from uh, Hebrew. And then from chapter 3, verse 1 on, the gospel is written in the kind of Hellenistic Greek most common to the time. And because he included so much new material, Luke does, as compared to the others, it's littered with Greek words and terminology not found in the others. The very average student of Greek, uh, for example, might open up uh, the Gospel of John and have a pretty good time reading through it with a little help. Uh, but then grab the uh, Gospel of Luke and things become more halting <laughs> and uh, uh, you reach for the uh, lexicon a little more often and you only slowly make your way through Luke's text. There are a number of other things distinctive to his gospel, which will be better brought to light as we discuss it in relation to the other gospels. In the prologue that we just read, Luke mentions some sources he used in compiling his, his gospel. The history he records, he states, was handed down by people who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the, of the word. He asserts that he investigated all of it quite thoroughly in order to present it in the form that he does. Uh, no wonder then that there are some remarkable resemblances in Luke to the other Gospels. Uh, some are very close, some of, often word for word. Uh, you'll find some incidents of Jesus' life in all three synoptic Gospels. I know this group reads your Bible a lot, and in most of your Bibles have in the margin. Uh, you come to an incident, you're familiar with the incident because you've read it so many times, and you look over in the margin, this is where Matthew records it, this is where Mark records it, this is where John even records it. Uh, so you'll find some uh, incidents in Jesus' life that are recorded in all three synoptic gospels, some in Matthew and Mark alone, some in Luke and Mark alone, and even some in Luke and Matthew alone. And sometimes uh, the narrative or the sayings are quite close in expression, some only similar, uh, occasionally both close enough and different enough to make one think that they are only similar events that took place separately. And then there's also plenty of material belonging uniquely to Luke. For example, I've mentioned the, the lengthy uh, birth narratives of both John the Baptist and Jesus. 
I'm mindful of the fact that we're going to be going through these chapters that we normally hear churches go through around Christmas time, and we'll be going into Easter and, and summer. But I've mentioned these birth narratives, the entire first and second chapters, and much of the third chap chapter consists of new or mostly new material not found in the other Gospels. And then you go to the central core of the book from chapter 10 through chapter 18. And that section contains an estimated 34 uh, sections in whole or in part, which appeared nowhere else, but seem to have come from sources other than the, these other gospels. Well, that shouldn't surprise us in the light of Luke's opening words, indicating his account came from eyewitnesses who had handed down what they had seen and heard. Luke could have inter interviewed dozens, even hundreds of people. Now, I realize this may be of little interest to some of you, but it has been of enormous interest to scholars over the centuries who have even coined their own terminology to describe what must have been Luke's sources. Where did he get this material? A significant portion of the material found in Mark's gospel is also found in Luke. Almost all of Mark is found in Luke. Uh, most agree that Mark wrote his gospel first, and both Matthew and Luke had access to Mark's gospel uh, when they wrote their own. It serves as a, a baseline of sorts. But there's also material found in both Luke and Matthew, and not in Mark. Not always verbatim, uh, but clearly the same, and this material get ready, the scholars have labeled as the Q source. Uh, why it's called Q is debated, but Q it is. Uh, interestingly, almost all of those common verses in Matthew and Luke consist of sayings of the Lord and not uh, narrative material. And then the content that is unique to Luke is labeled the L material. And should you be wondering, what about the Gospel of John and Luke? Well, there are a striking number of points of contact between the two, uh, more than John's Gospel has with either Matthew or Mark. And here are some very well-known New Testament figures, for example, mentioned only by Luke and John. Annas, the high priest mentioned only by Luke and John. Martha and Mary, the two sisters of Lazarus. And a disciple named Judas, who was distinct from the notorious uh, Judas Iscariot. Another link between the two is that in neither of the other two gospels do Samaria and the Samaritans figure as prominently as they do in Luke and John. Uh, Luke, in several places, you read about Samaria or Samaritans. And John, famously, in his fourth chapter with the account of the Samaritan woman at the well. Moreover, uh, only in Luke and John are these bits of information provided. That Satan entered the heart of Judas. That it was the right ear of the high priest's servant that was struck by Peter that Pilate pronounced at least three times Christ's innocence, that the tomb in which Joseph of Arimathea laid Jesus in had never been used before, that there were two angels present on the morning of the resurrection, and that subsequently Jesus' appearances took place in Jerusalem. And finally, Peter's own visit to the empty tomb is mentioned briefly by Luke, but then more fully in John chapter 20. Now, how this convergence of material came about isn't exactly clear. It's likely both Luke and John had access to a source or sources that the other two gospel writers did not have, but we don't know that for sure. Uh, John's primary source, naturally, was his own remembrance, his own time spent with 
the Lord, uh, but we just don't know for sure. But also Luke had his own distinctive style and interests. As I already noted, he took delight in mentioning individuals. You read through Luke, and he took more interest in specific individuals, especially those of lesser social standing. Uh, perhaps that was because of his own servant's heart, or the fact that he was a medical doctor, and he had chosen a career in which he would care for others who were suffering. But he took special note of actors in the gospel account that others ignored. He wrote not only of John the Baptist, but of John the Baptist's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. I mentioned Martha and Mary, but Zacchaeus uh, also, only Luke mentions Zacchaeus. And Cleopas, the woman who anointed Jesus' feet. One of the great themes of the Bible is God's care and concern for the lowly and the humble of the earth, for those lightly esteemed by the world, and Luke seemed to have gone out of his way to focus on those. In a day and time uh, when women were accorded little regard and, and were generally treated as second-class citizens, Luke gives them prominence. Uh, we hear their names more than in any other gospel. Mary, Elizabeth, Anna, Martha, her sister Mary, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, the widow of Nain, the widow who gave all she had, the daughters of Jerusalem, uh, the women that appear in Jesus' parables. Jesus loved babies and, and children, and Luke seems to have picked up on that with an eagerness lacking in the other gospel writers. It's Luke that gives us the vivid picture of the infant Jesus born and laid in, laid in a manger. He tells us of John the Baptist's birth as well. He follows the Lord as a young boy going into Jerusalem in a caravan with, with his family. Uh, Luke, too, takes special note uh, in describing these uh, people that approach Jesus for help for their only son, their only daughter. Luke brings into relief in his history more examples of Jesus' regard for the poor and the disreputable. There are too many examples of his concern for the poor to cite, but we remember vividly the tax collectors and sinners who gathered to, to meet him, the hated Zacchaeus, the reception that Levi gave for him, at which Luke records there was a great crowd of tax collectors and sinners eating and drinking with them. He tells us of the prodigal son and of the sinful woman who wept over Jesus' feet and how Jesus told her that her many sins were forgiven and she loved much. In reading Luke, we're especially reminded of our own poverty and disrepute and encouraged to emulate our Lord who showed such care and concern for us that he sought us out and mended our brokenness. Kent Hughes wrote that Luke was a tender doctor of souls. But we should ask the question at the beginning, who was Luke? Who was Luke? We actually know very little about him for someone who wrote so much of our New Testament, yet for us to know so little about the man himself leads us to infer that he was first a self-effacing man, not prone to self-promotion. Uh, secondly, he was a medical doctor. Uh, Paul referred to him as the beloved physician. Not so much, perhaps, because he wanted to identify Luke as a physician, but rather because he was beloved to him uh, late in life. Uh, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, Only Luke is with me. His occupation no doubt contributed to his tendency to describe Jesus' healings in more explicit terms, making a note of details others omitted, the fever that Matthew and Mark record that Peter's mother-in-law had come down with. Luke calls it a high fever. Uh, the leper, described in Luke chapter 5, 
Luke observes he was covered with leprosy. Thirdly, Luke was a Gentile. A tradition held him to be so, but, but Paul too in Colossians 4 again distinguished him from those, quote, of the circumcision. He was not a Jew. And most likely he was from Antioch. Again, that's the tradition. Both Eusebius and Jerome attest to that. Uh, perhaps Paul first met him in Antioch, in which case that ex might explain why uh, the city of Antioch played such a central role in Paul's life as recorded by Luke in Acts. And that is the thing that distinguished Luke the most, that he was Paul's faithful companion. While not explicitly identify him, identifying himself on Paul's second and third missionary journeys, uh, the telltale we sections found in those chapters in Acts reveal his presence with Paul, along with the times that he stayed behind while Paul traveled on, uh, notably once in Philippi, where he spent quite a bit of time, and that's led some people to think that Luke was from Philippi and not from, from Antioch. What all this means is that Luke <clears throat> spent an enormous amount of time with the Apostle Paul, and that invariably had an influence on him. Uh, students of the gospel uh, often point out details and nuances he provides that seem to have more of the spirit of Paul than the other gospel writers, or, or at least the synoptic gospel writers. I won't take the time to list all of those, but uh, Hendrickson, for example, devotes a good section of his introduction to the gospel of Luke to those common themes between Luke and Paul. Perhaps the most striking example of the influence one had on the other is the almost identical account that Luke gives of the institution of the Lord's Supper to that which Paul gives in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, one resembles the other almost word for word. But the last thing we must say about Luke the man is that he was an authentically meticulous historian. Even uh, secular students of classic literature, uh, impartial as concerning the claims uh, of faith, find in Luke's qualities one of the very best and most reliable historians of antiquity. I'm quoting there from the New Bible Dictionary, but uh, his combined Luke Acts uh, contribution to the canon of Scripture has been called one of the finest pieces of historical writing in all of ancient history. As is typical, many of the things Luke represented in his history have been challenged over the years. Nothing new about that. In every case, uh, the objections were eventually proven baseless. Uh, questions were asked, for example, about Luke's second chapter and his assertion there that a census was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. There was no evidence for years of that other than Luke's own record of it. Uh, were people really required to travel to their ancestral homes as Luke represented for the census? Did John the Baptist begin his ministry as Luke states in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, when Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene. Not that Abilene, the other Abilene. <laughs> and from Acts, when Paul preached in Cyprus in chapter 13, verse 7, did that island have a, a proconsul? And in chapter, I remember teaching through Acts and, and, and reading all about that. And in chapter 18, when Paul was in Corinth on his second missionary journey, was Gallio, proconsul of Achaia, and, and so on. All of these assertions were once, Luke's assertions were once called into question. And in every case, archaeological discoveries, historic advancements proved that Luke's statements were true. So this is what we know about Luke, more but enough uh, for today. We should mention Luke's purpose in writing, which becomes apparent as one reads through the gospel and, and reads through the book of Acts. 
At the same time, the various themes that he emphasizes are related to his purpose, so I want to begin with the themes. Uh, everything about which Luke writes starts with the love of God. Behind every verse and every chapter is the animating power of God in love, working out his purpose to save a people for himself. As A.H. McNeil put it, if Matthew's keynote is royalty and kingdom, and Mark's is power, in Luke, it is love. Luke viewed God's love as vast and touching all corners of humanity. The salvation he provides is universal in the sense that it's revealed to a wide variety of people. The gospel was for the Jew first, but also for the Gentiles. We've mentioned the Samaritans. Uh, but Luke also relates how Jesus spoke approvingly of other non-Israelites, such as the widow of Zarephath and Naaman the Syrian. It is from Luke that we learn of the healing of the centurion slave and of people from coming from all directions of the compass to recline at the table in the kingdom of God. More than the other gospel writers, Luke announces through the words of the Lord and the apostles that God's salvation has come through the Jews, but abounds to all peoples. The word salvation uh, is not even found in Matthew and Mark. I'm not trying to denigrate those gospels by any means, but it's not found there. But Luke makes use of it five times, and also the verb to save more than the other Gospels. Luke records the lowly shepherds hearing the angel proclaim that today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Later, Simeon would hold the baby Jesus in his arms and bless the Lord because his eyes had seen God's salvation, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Only Luke uh, records that. Not surprisingly, then, peace is another prominent theme in Luke. He uses the word 13 times, while Matthew has it only four times. Mark once, John only six. The only other New Testament book that comes close to Luke in using the word, word peace is Paul in the book in the Epistle to the Romans. He uses it 10 times. Well, I said theme and purpose are related. Here, then, is Luke's purpose in writing. It is to accurately record how God is working out his great purpose in saving his elect. In his gospel, remember, Luke, more than any of the gospel writers, portrays Jesus as steadfastly uh, making his way to Jerusalem to meet what awaited him there. He set his face like flint to go to the cross. It is Luke who recorded the Lord's words in chapter 12, verse 50, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. The salvation of sinners was the mission his father had sent him to accomplish, and Luke wished to shine the light of his gospel upon it. Many people cross paths with the Lord Jesus on his earthly sojourn, and one might wonder why Luke alone chose to include his encounter with Zacchaeus. Perhaps it was so he could record for posterity what Jesus told that repentant sinner Today, salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. The son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The saving of sinners was Christ's entire mission. Well, William Hendrickson's uh, detailed outline and helpful outline of the Gospel of Luke is headlined by this, the work thou gavest him to do. The work thou gavest him to do. 
And we might add, if the work thou gavest him to do is the touchstone of the purpose of his gospel, then Luke went on in the book of Acts to report how the gospel spread. It becomes the story of the early church and the outworking of Jesus' great commission that his church would be his witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And eventually the gospel would find its way to you and to me. Don't you remember the first time it made it all the way to us? Not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, the nobodies. But we're here at the beginning of Luke's two-part work of history. He addresses it, look now again at our scripture, he addresses it to most excellent Theophilus. That was a polite form of address that one might use with so someone who was of higher social standing, though we can't infer that for sure. The truth is we don't know who Theophilus was. Some of you have studied it. You think you might know. I don't think you do, but uh, <laughs> only, we only know that Luke wished to accomplish something with him and through him. And in these opening four verses, we have the simplest version of Luke's purpose in writing. Something remarkable had occurred in the ancient land. It wasn't a pandemic or a war or a scientific advance. It was the arrival on the scene of a man who would change the course of human history. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus had unwittingly captured the gravity of the event when they incredulously asked the risen Lord in Luke chapter 24, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? Those things, those things are what concerned our evangelist Luke. He was not the first. Uh, many, he said, had undertaken to compile an account of those things, and Luke had been collecting them, uh, gathering up all the eyewitness reports and the stories and, and sayings of so many people who had, since those initial days, uh, themselves become servants of what was now the established message of Jesus Christ. The word was now the gospel, and they were servants of the gospel. And Luke, who had had the great privilege of firsthand accounts of all that had happened and who had been witnessed to the spiritual power that had come in the wake of the person and work of Jesus, arrived at the notion that now it was absolutely fitting for him as well, since he had carefully conducted his own investigation of all things pertaining to this remarkable historical sea change that had occurred to now definitive, definitively write it all down in an orderly and lucid way. And here, here is the profound thing that motivated Luke in verse 4, that Theophilus might know the exact truth about the things he had been taught so far. Luke wrote for the sake of the truth. Truth is important. Uh, the world is filled with lies and liars. So Luke knew that what he was doing was important. Everything he would record would be disputed. The sacred things he had learned, discovered, and, and now carefully cataloged and revealed would be disdained and mocked and profaned. But Luke was presenting to Theophilus a magnificent gift. Here in this transcript, the scroll 
was the gift of truth. And if he would accept it and make Luke's truth his own, then salvation would come to his house. And now it's our privilege uh, to hold it in our hands uh, also, the exact truth. May we handle it with care and with grateful hearts, and may the Lord bless our, our study of this book. Father, we do pray that. Uh, it's not uh, a throwaway line at the end of a lesson that we uh, are wasting our time if uh, you're not in it, if we don't have your grace and mercy, if we don't have the ministry of your spirit. Dan is beginning today a series on Galatians, how we look forward to that, but it too will be a waste of his energy and gift uh, if your spirit is not in it. How we thank you, Lord, uh, that it was your great passion to send your son so that you might save a people for yourself. And it was only through him, it is only through him, that we have life. And that is the message of Galatians. That's the message of Luke as well. So we pray your blessings upon uh, the coming lessons, however many there may be, uh, upon the lessons in Galatians, upon our observance today of the Lord's Supper, remembering him in this way. We pray in his name. Amen.